Matt Mandari is joining us today from New York, violist, improviser, composer, and band leader. He'll be in Seattle on Monday, October 30th for Earshot Jazz Festival. Earshot.org is the URL for more information. Matt, thanks so much for coming on the show. And thanks for having me. Take us through your formative years, if you would. You come from a musical family. You recorded with your father, Joe Maneri. Absolutely. How did you wind up on viola, one of the historically underrepresented voices in Western music? Well, weirdly, um, I, I switched to viola rather late in the game. Um, I started at five years old on violin. I took, I'll tell a quick story about that. My parents took me to a music store and said, pick any instrument, but you got to stick with it. So I looked around the room and saw an instrument with four strings. I counted them, one, two, three, four. I said, this has got to be easy. <laughs> so I ended up playing violin. And I studied classical most of my life. And then in my teen years, I switched to jazz and improvisation and mixed them both. Still playing violin and getting a violin with five strings so I can get down lower. And it wasn't until I did a ECM festival in Germany where I was at the festival and uh, one of the people that worked for ECM was trying an $80,000 viola. She was a classical violist. And she said, would you play it for me so I could hear it from back there? And I started playing uh, the viola and it just really touched me. And as soon as that was over, I ended up buying a viola and have been playing it ever since. Gosh, now about when was that, that festival? That was 1999. All so right. So I was already deep into my... <laughs> you were about 30 then. Yeah, I was uh, exactly 30, yeah. And you had played violin in some of the recordings you made with your father. Yeah, and electric violins with lower strings and things like that. But I didn't really get an acoustic viola till 1999, yeah. You studied with violinist Robert Koff from the Juilliard String Quartet. Correct. And I believe you said he helped you find a way to use the bow like a trumpet, like Miles Davis. Can you tell us what you meant by that? Well, he was... Um... First of all, he was an extraordinary teacher. He really, I was ready to quit violin, honestly. And then he came along and really got me enthusiastic about playing the music again, um, just with his knowledge and, you know, being, I was also in a string quartet that he was coaching and just finding the inner voice and this and that. Um, he was just a wonderful man. And then when he started uh, teaching me, like he was had a real infinity for Baroque music and the Baroque bow is a little different in the way you hit the tones are different in Baroque music. And I found that very similar to the horn, the trumpet, you know, and miles and started using that more and more in my improvisation. And it just became like, oh, there's a different way. You don't have to play, you know, with vibrato and classical, you know, push and shove. Uh, it's a much different kind of bowing style that really kind of worked for the kind of music I was interested in. The bow is slacker in Baroque period instruments. Yeah, the Baroque bow is actually very different. I still play on a Western uh, updated bow, but I use the style of it. Uh, so it's it, it was just a revelation of how to really kind of hit notes in a different way to create a tone in a slightly different way. So the fact that you don't play with a lot of vibrato and that you often use these bending pitches like Miles Davis did, is that all kind of attributable to the experience you had with Baroque music? Uh, I, well, uh a lot, large portion, sure. Uh, also, because my father was an improviser and he played saxophone and clarinet, and he was also interested in world music. He would play like Sephardic music and Greek music and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and bending the notes, he became more and more interested in microtonal music, uh, the notes between the notes. Like if you imagine a piano and between the, the cracks of the keys, there's other notes that, that you can play. So I was always interested in that. So let's talk about the quartet that you're bringing to Seattle. Basically, it's the instrumentation of John Coltrane's famous quartet, but with viola instead of saxophone. Exactly. Uh, you, you recorded an album with them in 2019 called Dust, and we just heard a track from your new album, Ash. What's with all these references to Dust and Ash? Absolutely. Well, the first record we did was called Dust, um, and... The, the way we were writing the music and trying to uh, convey these notes, um, there's a way that like dust is around everything. It's kind of floating in the air. You try to grab it, you quite, can't quite get it, but it's around us and it's there. And it's just kind of effervescent, but but settles and it doesn't settle. And the kind of that mystery that I, I was fascinated by. Uh, so when we finished that record, I immediately started planning a trilogy. <laughs> so there's going to be a third one, by the way, which will be called Mist. But uh -huh. for Ash, uh, yeah, so <laughs> F 
for Ash, I wanted to delve into memories and how like we distort memories, how we embellish memories, how we kind of burn them away sometimes like ash. And it's also like dust, it's, it's there, but it's not there. You try to touch it, it floats away. Uh, so that was the, the genesis of doing ash was like really taking memories and the elusiveness of memories. Now, dust and ash, that also calls to mind the the saying about ash to ash and dust to dust, and images of death are kind of what I would associate with that. The music does have, at least to me, this mournful, plaintive quality. That was also a very big part of it. Um, You know, my father passed away, and then uh, I was taking care of my mother during the pandemic, and then right after that, she passed away. And so there was a lot of these kind of... uh, especially with my mother, uh, with Ash, uh, her passing away and spending so much time with her in the pandemic, just the two of us, eight months, uh, a lot of memories came up. And that's why the second record, Ash, is about memory, distortion of memories, how we see the memories differently when I was talking to my mother in those last months. Lots of drooping figures in the viola and the piano. Yeah, I mean, I've always been called the kind of a... <laughs> somewhat mournful jazz player. I've even been called the, the goth jazz guy or, <laughs> you know, I've been described that way. I've, I've always been attracted to that. I was in goth bands and I've always loved the melancholy. You know, it, it speaks to me and, and and that's how I try to convey these memories. So let's talk about the quartet, how it came together, how you choose your personnel. Absolutely. Um. Well, on piano is Lucian Bond. He's... um. A pianist I've been working with for over 13 years now. We met kind of haphazardly. He was doing a project uh, reimagining the music of Enesco, a Romanian composer, one of the most famous composers there. And um, he suddenly needed a replacement for a cellist. And uh, Nasheed Waits recommended me on the viola. And I took it. And uh, we played a piece where it just said, viola and piano do an intro. We never rehearsed it. And we're in this big hall in Romania, in Bucharest, and played this duet. And immediately, both of us, right after the show, said, wow, that was something special. We should play again. And we've been doing it since th- for 13 years. Uh, John Hebert is a bass player I, I just admire so much. We've been playing since the 90s on and off. Uh, he's just got this wonderful uh, rubbery quality where he can just kind of fit in all the cracks and just kind of give us the glue we need. And uh, Randy Peterson on drums is my oldest collaborator. We started in 1988, I believe playing together and working on this music for so long now. And um, and then eventually we added my father, Joe Maneri, and we became the Joe Maneri Quartet in like 1990. So these collaborators are like long-term relationships that have just been cultivating uh, these ideas over so many years. It's just a joy to play with them. And in Seattle, we'll be seeing Brandon Lopez instead of... Yeah, unfortunately, John can't make the gig, so Brandon Lopez will be playing bass. So we've been doing this tour with Brandon, and he's been great. Uh, it's a hard, hard, you know, it's hard shoes to fill because John had such a unique sound with the band, and Brandon's just been doing a lovely job. Brandon is also a flotation device veteran. Cool. Now, after the interview, we're going to play another track from the Ash album. It's called Glimmer. And this one's a Lucien Bon tune. Yes. It sounds a bit different than the other tracks on the album. Are you going to play it at Cornish on Monday? I believe we will. Yeah, actually. Yeah, that's in the list. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And Glimmer, is, you know, so much of the music we were talking about, how it's a little uh, maybe melancholy. And Glimmer is that little, you know, glimmer of hope kind of thing, <laughs> that moment on the record where it's not all doom and gloom, you know. It is a bit more up-tempo. And uh, well, we'll look forward to the Mist album and see if, that's even more optimistic than the dust and the ash. Yes, it, it's, it's meant to be more luminous and kind of uplifting, I think. My guest is violist Matt Mineri, who is bringing his Ash Quartet to Seattle on Monday, October 30th. That's tomorrow to perform in the Earshot Jazz Festival. Concert is at 7.30 p.m. at the Raysbeck Auditorium at the downtown campus of Cornish College of the Arts. Tickets and information are available at earshot.org. I want to ask you about another project you've been working on with Lucien Bon, who is a longtime collaborator of yours, as you mentioned. He's also a native of Romania, yeah. and it takes as its source an opera by Romania's most famous composer of art music, who you just mentioned, George Enescu. Yeah, well, when we were 
talking about before how we started this uh, adventure together was with reimagining Enesco's music. And it wasn't the opera. We did other pieces. And early on, I, I had said to Lucian, you know, like, we should take a look at that opera he did, uh, you know, and, and Lucian's like, yeah. And we started looking at it and there was so many soulful, bluesy lines that we thought we could really sink our teeth into. Now that's Oedipus in French. Yes, yes. It's not really well known, this this opera by Inescu outside France and, and Romania, I suppose. It's languished in the shadow of Stravinsky's much more famous setting of Oedipus Rex. Sure. In fact, in the U.S., Inescu is mainly known for that one Romanian rhapsody that appears on all of those orchestral showpiece albums. Well, uh, like I said, it has such an interesting tonal quality, these kind of winding little lines that are definitely from like Romanian or Hungarian folk kind of sounds. and um, But then mixing it with kind of modern harmonies of the 20th century and then doing it in such a way that almost felt like a bluesy doina to me, you know, and just with the voice and, and we thought we could really do something interesting with it. And it's actually gained uh, some notoriety over the past uh, couple of decades and we hope to keep shining light on it. There was a production of it in, in Paris recently that was interesting, and perhaps the music sounds like Debussy might have sounded if he'd been from Eastern Europe instead of from France. <laughs> We're hearing an excerpt from Inescu's Oedipus in the background, and we'll hear an excerpt from your album, Oedipus Redux, in our next set. Can you tell us what you're working on now? We did a recording recently with uh, Lucian Ben and I and uh, John Sermon. We did a recording doing uh, like Transylvanian folk songs that were transcribed by Bartok. He uh, was like a music anthropologist in the, in the early 1900s. He went all over the region and transcribed or recorded on wax cylinders these beautiful folk melodies. So we've been making it an effort to like really kind of reinvent them, but also keep that soul alive of the original kind of weird intonations and wonderful kind of tripping melodies they do um and it's been such a blast and we also did a duet lucian and i that's coming out on ecm next year also with the bartok uh, transcriptions of uh, the romanian folk songs and in november we're recording again with john sermon and we're adding brad jones on bass and then lucian bonami and we were just rehearsing right now some of these romanian folk songs that we're retranscribing again different ones uh, and then uh, one of them, I was just using this melody, and the melody was so interesting to me, but it reminded me of Carla Bley. So I started doing some mixtures of Carla Bleyisms and this melody, and it just came out so beautiful, because I've been thinking a lot about Carla and her great compositional force and her playing. So it was nice to be able to like kind of you know pay a little tribute to her. And of course, Carla Bley passed away earlier this month, and we've been paying tribute to her yes. on tonight's show with more to come. So much to look out for from Matt Maneri on the ECM label. And what's the other label? that The other the label other is Sunnyside. So you'll find the, the the trio with John Sermon, Lucian, and my, me and on the Sunnyside, as well as my Ash Quartet and Dust Quartet is on the Sunnyside label. As well as the Oedipus Project. Yes. And speaking with violist and band leader Matt Maneri, who will be appearing with his Ash Quartet at the Earshot Jazz Festival tomorrow night, October 30th, at Hornish College's Raisebeck Auditorium in downtown Seattle. Show starts at 7.30. Tickets and information are at earshot.org. And Matt, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks so much for taking time out for us. And we'll see you in Seattle. And thank you so much for taking an interest. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Here is Glimmer by the Ash Quartet, followed by Oedipus Redux. Music by Matt Maneri on Flotation Device. Thank you. 